Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. I doubt anyone needs to be reminded that it's summer. And if there's one truth with regard to this summer is that we all desperately need to play. And we can play too hard. We can play with a kind of effort to re-enter Eden. But whatever, we need to be in a concentrated period of beauty that captures us, that captivates us, and opens the door for a level of restoration. So that's what we're going to talk about, uh, inviting you to consider how you're going to play. And whether that play, uh, honestly, uh, is up to the capacity and goodness of what your soul really needs. So I am with not only my dear friend, Rachel Clinton Chen, who is a fly fisher woman, and my good, good friend, Steve Call, whom I will be fishing with about the time this podcast comes into the light of day. So we, we're going to talk about fly fishing, but don't, don't, don't bail on us. We're going to be talking about that as one avenue for an entry into what our hearts and bodies most desperately need. But before we go much further, Rachel, give just a little bit of history to your fascination, compelling immersion into this God-given art. <laughs> well, I actually started fly fishing in high school with my dad and brother in Colorado. We I grew up in Oklahoma, but we'd always go to Colorado for the summers. And I just wanted to go. And really, I have a funny story. My first cast, I got a little brookie on my first cast and it came flying out and landed in my hand. And my dad thought I was a prodigy and just was so excited. And it became a really sweet place of getting to connect with my dad um, in a, you know, being on the river and learn, like learning something from him and getting to fish with him, which I now laugh because I think he would forgo like the more exciting fly fishing places because of how scared I was of bears. So we were always, we never really went to like super remote places, even though I actually learned initially to you know, use dry flies in creeks. That was how I learned. Um, and I learned to cast mostly on our little cul-de-sac because he got me a fly rod um, when I was in high school. And so I would practice out in the cul-de-sac, which I do think is evidence that fly fishing, if you really love it, can take you away in really beautiful ways, even on a concrete cul-de-sac, because there's something about casting a fly rod. However, I because of this skill I had, I got to be a camp counselor at a camp in Colorado because they needed a female fly fishing teacher. Now, the caveat is this camp, the kids got to choose. It was seventh through 12th grade. They got to choose their outdoor adventure, you know, things from like seniority down. So the girls that were choosing fly fishing were all seventh graders because they basically got their last choice. Like the girls were not signing up for fly fishing. But it was like all the older boys that were signing up for fly fishing. So I was on the river with like seventh graders uh, who were super pumped that there were like older boys fly fishing on the river. And they also thought making woolly buggers because we got to do some tie flying <laughs> and they would make like hot pink woolly buggers, which was hilarious. Because if you know anything about fly fishing, it's a kind of fly. It's pretty basic and it's like a brown caterpillar looking thing. So hot pink woolly buggers. Um, but once they did catch a fish, I think they caught on to something and I saw a shift in how they were engaging fly fishing. But I can say in full confidence, fly fishing is a lot more fun than teaching fly fishing, at least for me. I know you would disagree, Dan, but at least for me. Oh, I've never had the privilege, burden, or the sense of the antechamber of hell to have to teach seventh graders. So I think that 
would be alone one of those where you'd go teaching seventh graders anything requires a level of maturity depth of of patience and good character which i've never claimed so steve your entry into this art form well thank you again for the invitation to have a conversation with both of you it certainly is a privilege you know, Dan, you were actually my teacher, uh, which is how I was introduced to fly fishing and uh, what a what a beautiful beginning and continues to be a, a wonderful, I think, friendship between the two of us and the joy I think that uh, is so evident and so prevalent in, in our times together. But I, I think the way in which uh, fly fishing captivates us, uh, and it was very true from the moment. I think I put a, a fly line in the water till this day as I anticipate our trip for next week. I think there's just something so beautiful uh, and so life-giving and so restorative. Uh, but you were my teacher and continue to be. And uh, that that has been, uh, I think, such a joy to learn from you in that way. And uh, the, the times and opportunities that we've had to play together on the river uh, has just been absolutely life-giving. Oh, e- easily. But I, I do, I will push back. I did help you enter, but because of, uh, we'll just call competence and a deep, deep, deep uh, intuitive grasp, y- you exceeded me very soon in the process. So I will often from the other side of the river go, what are you using? What are you doing? Why am I not catching? Uh, I, I'm usually not that whiny, but that's what it feels like internally, even though I, I hold a little bit more uh, mature. Oh, Steve, what are you? What did you catch the last 42 fish on? Damn it. But truly, uh, one of the benefits uh, beyond all that we're putting words to is for all for all three of us, it has been something that has captured us. Um, there's something about being on the water. Um, uh, it, there are times where I get uh, actually a little bit tired catching a fish. I'll cut the hook off and just fish with the fly. So to watch a fish come, uh, it this is more than fishing and catching fish. There's something about the experience of fly fishing in particular on a river that I want both of you to try and at least put words to. Why is it so compelling? And then I want you both to try and address the question of why do we need something that so deeply captivates us. Steve, you're about to go on a a fishing trip. So I feel like this might be a little closer to you than it is to me. Uh, Well, I mean, just this morning I was preparing for our trip next week. And I think there's something about uh, regardless of what play, what type of play we each enter into, you know, we're talking about fly fishing. And I think there's, there's something absolutely life giving about the anticipation of play. Uh, And I think, (laughs) That in and of itself, uh, sometimes it, it's not more restorative, but I think sometimes it's just as restorative. So the anticipation of play. So I, I think that's what was I was aware of this morning. I was captivated by the preparation, just you know, setting aside flies and looking at things of what I want to take and not take. And, and I think that is uh, something uh, just to be mindful around, uh, is that when we anticipate play, there is something uh, that allows us to, to pause and to breathe and to reflect. And what is it that I enjoy and what is it that I look forward to? And uh, I think I think the invitation for us to be intentional about the mindfulness of preparation, I think there is just something truly, truly beautiful about it. I do think, you know, Dan, you know, you've, we've had some conversations through the years of what is it about being on the water? What 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 is it about the water? And I... I mean, I, I think I've said playfully a few times, you know, just, I mean, we travel all the way to Montana, we'll get into the water, maybe fish for 10 minutes. And then I have said, I think I, I could go home now if we had to. And mm-hmm. it's, it's not so much about the, the length of time, although that's a beautiful part of, of, of fishing, but it's also the, the freedom uh, that we experience in, in that moment of nothing else matters uh, mm-hmm. other than this moment. And I think that's, mm-hmm. what's restorative. It's that, that, Life is set aside for a moment or two, however long that is for each of us, uh, in a way that that allows us to reflect on what truly matters. 
And so there, there, there is, uh, I would just say a healing balm to being in water. A, it's almost like a baptism sort of, uh, mm-hmm. experience that there is a, there is a, a res- I can't get away from that word restored, restorative along those lines that, that I, I'm good now. Uh, I can go back. Yeah. I mean, I think in a very similar way, it's, um, such an embodied sensual experience being near water. Like a river has a sound to it, like not just the rushing water, but the way it moves the rocks. It's, there's something ancient to a river too. Like the, the sense of it's been cutting a path that yes, like ebbs and flows and changes. Um, usually if you're in a good fishing spot, you are somewhere remote. And even if you can still get there by car, you have to hike a little bit. So you are in a, in a kind of quiet. Um, it's the quiet of nature, which if you're listening, isn't actually that quiet. It tends to be have its own kind of symphony. Um, I know for myself, two things I would say. One, because I learned to fly fish with my dad. Um, and that was such a special way to connect. And it's not always easy for us to connect. Um, and I could I would watch him play. Like I would watch him rest in ways that weren't necessarily kind of normal ways of getting to see him. But for myself as someone who's very hypervigilant, terrified of all the animals and like the mosquitoes, like all the different things that could kind of distract and annoy you. I do lose a sense of time and space and I lose that kind of constant like fearful watching of what's around me so that's a rare space of rest for me to be doing something that even in the midst of kind of potential for danger I can just lose myself and and there's a certain kind of rhythm to fly fishing and there's also the challenge I mean depending on what kind of fish you're fishing but trout for example are very mischievous and very playful and even if they're not smart and we're just like giving them these characteristics <laughs> like you no, know they to, do yeah like to to kind of be outwitted by a fish and and the excitement of that and the interaction and the the play of interacting with nature in that way but there is such an art um to even casting and when you get in that rhythm i think my guess would be i'm sure someone's written some kind of scientific book on like what is happening in your neural pathways when you're fly fishing, but it feels like a kind of rhythm and movement that almost has like a, like a, such an, a rocky nature to it that I'm sure there's actually like something happening in your brain. That's very healing and mending. Um, But yeah, there is a baptismal um, reality to it. And and a way of being in nature and attuned to nature that I think is different than when you're just like camping or kind of just out playing in nature. There's a different kind of connection. Oh, again, to start with, no, I, I often pray for a highly impulsive, somewhat addicted, hungry and stupid fish. And that those are the ones that find my flies most attractive. But yeah, I, let, let me go back to the fact that there's a rhythm. You're not just tossing a line and then waiting for it to hit the water and then waiting to see if there's a fish. There's an actual rhythm. And the rhythm isn't quite the same, but it's similar to what's called davening uh, or what before the Western Wall, more Orthodox Jews would rock. So there is a kind of rocking, a presence of movement that's somewhat similar, if you know the terms, to EMDR. So there is soothing, but you're in beauty. And so it is overwhelmingly captivating. And trout, You can't find them in less than beautiful, but somewhat rugged places that tend to have wildlife. And Steve and I have encountered uh, some some unpleasant, large, carnivorous predators. Uh, We won't go into the detail, but as I stood with my dear friend on the other side of a river about 25, 30 yards away, a very large grizzly watched us for about 15 minutes. And I don't know how he knew it. About 10 minutes in, he looked at me and he said, you're thinking about running. And I, I, I had, my cortisol was at a point where I was out of my mind. And he said, if you run, 
it will chase you down. And I promise you, I will do nothing to save you. It's your choice. Stand with me or get eaten. I chose, but it didn't feel like a choice to stand with him. And eventually, obviously, we got out of that particular situation. What I'm getting at is you need rest, you need beauty, and you need danger. And let me promise you, Disney World doesn't do it. It may have pretend danger and a little bit of movement, but it doesn't have the beauty that you were meant for. So golf. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, It's fine. Uh, you, You can get absorbed. I guess the danger is, you know, like being hit by some fool behind you. But overall, we're coming back to you need to be in a place where there's this intersection of eternal eternality at a beauty level that takes you away from not just the mundane, not just TikTok time, but takes you into a context in which your heart, your heart just is able to both find rest, but also exhilaration. And there's very few things in life that hold the ability to have rest and beauty, but also a sense of exhilaration and anticipation, which takes me quickly to the fact that at least fly fishing is a form of intermittent reinforcement, which is the same dynamic as gambling. Every time I put a fly out, something compelling could occur. And it doesn't, it doesn't for 45 minutes. But when that fish hits, even if I don't catch it, my body produces adrenaline, noradrenaline, stress biochemicals, but mingled with dopamine. Oh, sweet, sweet dopamine. And then because it's exhausting, a little bit of endorphins, we're talking about a cocktail of glory. Okay, I'm going to (laughs) stop. I think that's why. But when you add, like Heraclitus, a pre-modern, pre-Socratic philosopher, the wonder of a river, where does it all come from? It moves at the same speed, same dynamic, yet it's never the same. That is such a taste of our God. And that's why the river of God, um, you know, you see it in the Psalms, you see it in Revelation. It is such a picture of the healing, restorative waters that we are all meant to drink from. So again, what I want to hear from both of you is, how does it remind you through the process of that encounter, whatever it be, whatever it, it's golf, it's riding on, what's the lumber ride you ride on at Disney World? Yeah. Not, yeah, you're on a, like a log. The log ride? The, the one where you go like on a log? Yeah, you go. Yeah, That's it. <laughs> uh, you know, whatever, whatever your form of engagement with lumber this, ride. what has it allowed and brought to you with regard to restoration? Yeah, I think I go back to that experience of being in my body in the wild, because I do think there's something like, you know, when you say danger, Dan, I'm like, sure, danger. But like, you don't really have to go that far in this world to experience danger. So I kind of want to caveat it like there's something about being in the wild. And it makes me think about like the way C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. There's these encounters with danger with the wild that's actually a part of God's creation. Um, there's a kind of getting to locate yourself. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think finding a kind of rest and a connection and attunement to something that is really fun. I mean, I've had times on the river where I don't catch, I catch like one fish, <laughs> But the journey to get to that one fish is like hours and hours of, you know, bites that I'm not quick enough, you know, to actually catch and or like catching a really big fish that wiggles off the hook in time. And there's there's that kind of anticipation that's pretty constant. And when you are in like a creek or river that's really meant for fly fishing, a lot of times you can actually see 
all the different colors of the water and you know the colors of the rocks under the water and sometimes if you're lucky you can see the colors of the fish too and so it's kind of a it's a very priestly um it's a very priestly act of like paying attention to all the smallest details and the way a current eddies and I even like listening to myself I'm like picturing someone who doesn't fly fish or like fly fishing being like wow okay we get it you really like fly fishing but there I think when you're someone who's hyper vigilant and paying attention to all the details of life and the noises and the sounds and the relationships and the faces and the kind of emotional undercurrents it's nice to be able to use that gift or that skill set in a different setting that is not requiring the same thing of you and is giving something to you that is mending and and playful. And I think your words, Steve, like restorative that you can leave and go, OK, like I'm good. I'm good for a long while. I'll I will spend the energy of this memory for a long season. I'll remember this for a time. Yeah, I do think there's that's really well said in in the way that there is something I think that is stored in our body. Uh, that we can draw upon uh, in in days, months uh, throughout the year where maybe we're overwhelmed and life is difficult. And and what do we draw upon? Not maybe not just the memory of that moment, but but the restorative healing balm, I think, that occurs when we play. Uh, and we're talking about playing in the water. And I, I think it, it can look play can look differently for each of us. And yeah. I don't think we have to fly fish, but we can use the stories of what fly fishing represent for us that invite listeners i think to to be mindful of what, where does the restorative process occur for for others where where are we intentional about uh allowing play to be something that is life-giving that we do draw upon i i do think you know being in the water and on the river there is there is an escape and, and it's not meant to just be an escape from reality but i but i think an escape from from the cares of the world that we carry naturally uh and that I think for me has has also been uh, such a life giving experience of all that matters is this moment, all that matters is this moment, and I, I think watching you know you Dan fish and when we have the privilege of fishing with others, I think watching you and your excitement, your exhilaration, the joy that comes across the others, particularly your face and your body in moments, it is also life giving. So how we build relationship, connect with others in that way, I think. So what if that was, I, I think, just a brief reflection of what the kingdom of God is, is that we are meant to be in relationship and what does play even look like in the midst of relationship? Yeah, I would go back to, I, I context is so compelling. The process, the interplay of something soothing, yet with a dynamic that involves high levels of, of, of our body's capacity for pleasure and uncertainty. All that's there. Uh, you know, that I'm talking about the eternality of a river and the importance it plays in scripture. It's not small. It's huge. But I fished many times by myself and it's good, very good. But I would much rather fish with you or other dear friends. Uh, Rachel, we got to fly fish together a couple summers ago in Colorado, and it wasn't long. Uh, you know, we did have a encounter with a bear, uh, but uh, the fact is, watching you catch even small little brook trout, it was so fun. It's not the size, it's not the place, it's the idea that we get to enjoy one another's participation in joy. And I think that's a very crucial part of play is I think if I were going out with a more, I mean, you're highly competitive, but not in this area, Steve, Rachel, your level of competition <laughs> makes Steve look like a slacker. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think I'm somewhat competitive, but you two are like off the freaking chart. But there's no competition when I've been with both of you in the water. There's just joy in the other's participation. And I think that's another portion of often we have play that's competitive and I'm all for it. 
But it's not the kingdom of God. I don't think we're going to be going, I got more pearls than you, sucker. So... (laughs) uh, Competition is not always about like, oh, I'm better than you. Sometimes it's about like, oh... Like, I pushed my body to, we did it. We overcame this challenge. But I hear you. Yeah. We're probably not going to be, I don't know. No, I I get your point. It's not always. But but the idea that something can produce such joy just watching another catch and, uh, and, and participate. I think now, if we can just capture a few things, we need things that immerse us. Uh, and Steve, you underscored that. Uh, like one of the benefits for me of fly fishing is we might begin on the river at eight or nine in the morning and 10 hours later, it's my body that's not able to keep going, but my spirit wants to go on endless. So time doesn't collapse. It gets put aside. It's a strange experience to be in something where time doesn't feel like it's the normal bind. And so that obviously is part of the refreshment. Uh, You also captured the notion of we need memory. I mean, even when I took out flies a few days ago, I'm looking at, oh, this is when we bought these or this worked here. I mean, just holding the flies was enough to kind of flood me with this gift of memory. So uh, we're, we're saying, what gives you a chance to be in the presence of beauty that captures you, that captivates, enthralls you, and in that helps you, in one sense, be out of time, but in goodness and that, I don't think it's going to be found in a Monopoly game. Uh, I don't think it's going to be found in a lot of our normal, quote unquote, oh, that was a good afternoon. It has to be planned. You've got to create categories that where where will I be absorbed in beauty? Where will I be refreshed by the goodness of the world around me? And where would I be brought back to memory? Those are categories that do up the ante to something other than just kind of like go to the beach and play, even though the beach could be the place where there's a lot of play very similar to what we're talking about. Yeah, if you've ever been body surfing for like hours and hours and hours trying to catch the perfect wave, you know, we just were at the beach with the boys and them learning how to boogie board and that sense of like, I'll keep coming back and I'll keep trying and I'm waiting and we're watching and, you know, you see the, oh, is this going to be it? Oh, no, this is too gentle. Okay, let's wait. I do think there's an, like, I think it's good for people to have an imagination of we're all going to be captivated by different things and there are going to be different ways of, of being connected. I think about dancing. I would imagine dancing for some people who love to dance when you have a good moment of dance, you know, whether I think personally some of the best dancing happens at weddings, but just when there's a sense of like, there's a reason to celebrate and you're moving with joy and delight and you lose a sense of time. And it doesn't matter if you're good at dancing or not, because that's not the point. Um, those are really particular contexts of dancing. Um, but I would imagine for many different people, even if you're going, I don't know if I'll ever fly fish or if that would be something I would love that you do have memories of something um, that you could say, yeah, I, I did. It was refreshing and transformative and conflict seemed to cease, even if there's challenge, even if there's risk, even if there's something wild that's a part of it or Dan, your word danger, like something that feels like maybe you're on the edge. Um, and yeah, that it, it calls your heart to beauty, reminds you that we are a part of something so much more compelling than sometimes we get to see, especially in the year and a half we've had uh, in this world. And I think we're all in need of just a reminder of why we care and why we stay in it and what are we fighting for. Um, And I think that that's part of what a moment of fly fishing can offer is a reminder that we are made for more than, than strife that we're made for more than like the futility of our labor and we're made for, uh, we are created and designed for delight and joy and play. 
Um, and we can't always get away to go fly fishing, but I think we can continue to intentionally create context and set aside time to be captured. Yeah, I would just echo that word of intentionality. I, I think that's what's so, so life giving is the intentionality of play. Um, you know, we, we plan our trips almost a year in advance. And I think there's that the reason we do that is so that there can be anticipation. So play is intentional. I think without that intentionality, no matter what we choose, uh, it's, it's difficult for us to be able to follow through with that. Well, that's where hiking can be. We have a, a dear friend who rode bikes 30, 40 miles on a, on a Saturday, you know, where you're doing something that again has the quality of repetition, but without being tedious, that takes you out of the norm of your normal world, but also introduces you to, again, we keep coming back to this notion of just something that captures you through beauty. And whatever that is, um, I, I don't think your reserves are going to be replenished, particularly after this gruesome and heartbreaking season, which isn't over and may be indeed even more intense as we go into the rest of the summer and fall. But you need reserves and you need restoration. And there are many ways to do so. Don't just take time off. Don't think that a day or two of a break will be sufficient. This is a season where each and every one of our hearts really is needing a taste of Eden. We can't make a way back in, but we can get the smell. We can get the sound and the taste. And whatever brings you that, that is your play. And that is the gift of God on your behalf. Steve, Lisa, I am so excited to get you to talk about your new podcast. Tell us, folks, why in the world you would submit your marriage to America? And like, what brain, shall we say, injury might have occurred to actually have made that choice? Thanks, Dan. That, I really appreciate how you're putting that. It makes me feel really, <laughs> really good. Yeah, it was it was a bit of a struggle to um, agree to want to put ourselves out there, but you know we've seen people influenced and impacted, and and they like to hear our hard stories, and we're all reminded that we're in this together. So, uh, so it's the Reconnect Marriage Podcast. It's been, I think, from my perspective, really fun. <laughs> <laughs> we have different perspectives. Uh, fun in just. Like Lisa's creative spirit comes alive, I think, when we when we talk about things that matter, and it it, it has been a form of play for us, I think. But but also, it it is really risky and vulnerable to speak about our marriage and marriages and uh, the the struggles, the heartaches, the difficulties, the joys, the sorrows. Yeah, and yeah. I think at the same time, we've been doing it enough now that it's kind of our new normal, and so we'll, you know, we'll get in a fight that morning, and we'll go, we'll get through it, and then we'll say, hey, that we'll use that. <laughs> we'll That's we'll a good that one to story. use. I cannot commend more strongly for folks to partake of your lives and your work through this podcast, through the book, through the conferences, through what you both offer. Well, thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org.